Well, hello, God bless you, Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. here, and I pray that you had a wonderful Independence Day. Isn't it wonderful to be an American? Isn't it wonderful to be in this country? And what is even more wonderful is to be in this country and serving the God of the Bible. We're in a country where we can we can still worship freely. We can still lift our hands because, you know, our freedoms came under assault during the pandemic. And in some places they tried to say you can't sing in church. Some places they said they put the church on the non-essential list. They did that here. And uh, pray for me. Uh, I haven't gotten over that yet. But I thank God that we got off that non-essential list. In my mind, we were never on it in the first place and we're able to worship and serve the Lord. And I pray that God bless this great land in which we live. Now, 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 speaking of that, I want to read a passage of scripture to you right quick here. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 33 and verse 22, it says, the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver and the Lord. Lord is our king. He will save us. The Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. What do you see there? You see the American judicial branch. You see uh, the American legislative branch, as well as the executive branch. Yes, God is our judge. G the judicial branch. God is our lawgiver. The legislative branch, both houses of Congress, and God is our king. Uh, the executive branch, the president. But let me talk to you just for, for a few minutes about our very active judicial branch, the Supreme Court and the court system. Uh, the Supreme Court was very busy on last week, and by God, thank God, they decided that 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 lady, the web designer, will not have to uh, design websites that go against her sincerely held beliefs. I applaud the, the uh, Supreme Court in that. I, I applaud the Supreme Court's uh, ruling against uh, the debt forgiveness program that President Biden uh, 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 issued, wh who said before he signed it that he probably couldn't do it. He knew that it wouldn't pass constitutional muster. And by the way, how can you forgive a debt that's not owed to you? God forgives us because we've sinned against him. The Bible says against thee and thee only have I sinned. David said and done this evil in thy sight. And the Lord sent Jesus Christ uh, to die on the cross to forgive us of our sins. How are you going to come up with a debt forgiveness program where the colleges and the universities who are owed the money they don't lose a dime. They don't get for, they don't forgive a penny. They don't let a penny go. But who pays the bill? The two thirds of people who do not attend college, the, major, the overwhelming majority of Americans who never set foot in a college or, the, or university, many of which could they didn't because they couldn't afford it. And so uh, this was a wealth transfer bill to shift uh, the 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 debt that students voluntarily accrued, uh, and I'm not saying that, that you know they weren't justified, but my point is, it, no one stuck a gun to their head and said go to college. Others who couldn't afford and and didn't go when they went into the workplace, workforce, and whatnot. So if you accumulated debt, then you're supposed to pay your debt. Or if the debt is forgiven, the debt should be forgiven by the entity who who is owed. And uh, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, the, the 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 colleges and universities were not. They weren't about to forgive a dime. They were expecting the U.S. taxpayer to pay the debt. So much for a debt forgiveness. Now, Jesus went to the cross. Jesus died on our behalf. Jesus paid it all, you see, but we had sinned against Jesus. Well, uh, so that's gone. And uh, I suggest that uh, college students are, are more responsible, uh, work their way through school. By the way, most of the college students who work while they're in school, uh, they become the overwhelming majority of billionaires, those who millionaires and billionaires, those who work and go to school and burn the midnight oil, midnight oil. by the time they come out, uh, they're, they're ready to hit the ground running. 
So, uh, uh, and, and another angle, Brother Gary, if you notice, no one, no, when the government gets involved, notice this, the prices, the price of everything goes up. How about asking the colleges and universities to kind of cut their prices? Because it seems to me some of these degrees don't don't bring about the lifetime uh, earnings and the income uh, that uh, you went to school to get them for in the first place. How about you, uh, colleges and universities? How about you, you know, cut the cost a little bit. Uh, since you have, many of you have huge endowments, you are multi-billion dollar operations. Uh, how about just, just lowering the tuition? And that will help the students a whole lot. But that's not what you want to hear me talk about. You want to get my take, those of you who want it, on what happened with regards to uh, the ruling the other day concerning uh, the Supreme Court. And, oh, that's so much People are so, people are losing their minds. People are having a hissy fit. People are saying affirmative action is dead. People are saying, oh my God, this wicked Supreme Court. And by the way, have you noticed that all of a sudden now we know who, who appoints Supreme Court justices? Now, uh, when uh, President Trump was the president, there were many judges that blocked uh, uh, various things that he was trying to do, and the media didn't, didn't never went on and said, an, Ob an Obama appointed judge blocked it, or a Clinton appointed judge. It was just a judge. But now we got to know who appointed the judge, who appointed the justices. We're politicizing this third uh, equal uh, a branch of government. See, the judicial branch is just as powerful as the executive branch. The judicial branch is just as powerful as the legis legislative branch. These are three separate but equal parts of our government. And what we're doing now, my friends, we're destroying the country because we're politicizing everything. Someone said, I won't call his name, that this is not a normal court. Is it not a normal court because it overturned Roe v. Wade? I thank God that it overturned Roe v. Wade. I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime. But right quick, before we invite you to church tonight, what has happened? What's going on with affirmative action? I was watching a newscaster, a news show the other day. And it's supposed to be conservative. And they said, we, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Supreme Court has ended affirmative action. I said to my wife, I said, did you hear that? That's a lie. Affirmative action is alive and well. What took place was the Supreme Court revisited something that was put, that was never put in place to last forever, uh, in the first place. And that was, uh, uh affirmative action being considered, race being considered as a factor in college admissions. In 2003, the gutter decision, uh, was made and even then, um, Chief Justice, Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, a member of the Supreme Court, said then, 25 years from now, this may not be necessary. This was in two, uh, 20, uh, 2003. Well, here we are in 2023, uh, 20 years later, and uh, the courts have uh, overturned that ruling. And I think that there should be free and healthy debate on whether it should or should not have. Maybe it should have waited five more years. Maybe it should have waited 10 more years. Somebody may think maybe it should have been 15 years sooner. Healthy debate is good, but when you're having healthy debate, how about let's talk about what we're talking about. Let's not make it what it is not and just push it into other areas, which is designed basically to get votes, to gin up one group against another, to do a lot of race baiting and make it seem like it's going to be the end of the world. Now, I am, I am, however, very concerned at... Um, why the ruling was what it was. You know, I just so happened to have here Brother Gary on my desk. Enrollment breakdown based on race and eth ethnicity. Dealing with Harvard University. Harvard University statistics shows that there are 39.7% white students enrolled in Harvard. 
13.7% Asian students, 9.4% Hispanic and Latino students, 6.56% Black or African American students, 3.9% students who identify with more than one race, and then 097 percent who identify as uh, American Indian or Alaska Native and 0.18 percent who identify as Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders. Now, you got 39 percent white and then your next largest number are Asian at Harvard. 13.7. So I guess the Asian students, since the claim was that black and brown brown students are getting some of your seats, I guess you wanted the Uh, 9.46 percentage of of, uh, Hispanics and uh, and the uh, 6.5 percent uh, of uh, of African American students, uh, that does jive well with me. Um, uh, now, I'm not talking uh, merely about the ruling, because I knew that this affirmative action law was not put in place to last forever. We can debate whether it should have stayed in place, or it should stay in place, or not. But uh, I am concerned that you have more Asians at Harvard, then you have African Americans. UNC, uh, 58.8% white, uh, 8.1% black, 6.8% Hispanic, these are uh, 2022 numbers, and 11.5% Asian, 4% uh, percent Indian. And 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 and, uh, and and look at this. Look at this. There's a there's, there's another group that I've mentioned, and I mentioned this. I don't know ten years ago because this is not a new thing that we're seeing. Ten years ago or better, uh, there is a huge swath of students that I think we should look at. And you know what they are? The legacy students which at Harvard accounts for 36% of the students and at UNC, 17% of the students. Now, what? who are your legacy students? Legacy preferences are given to students with familial relationships with the institution. That is, mom went, dad went, auntie went, uncle went, and they're good donors. And that gives that child, that student, uh, a preferential treatment that that is a, an affirmative action in and of itself any way you look at it so i would say to the asian student how do you know how do you know that it's not a legacy student's behind in that seat that you should be in versus a black or brown uh, student i don't know but i think these are things are, that are worth discussing and I think that we could have reasonable debate. And uh, we're not going to bring in it for today, uh, the, the role that the athletes play. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of them, quite, and God bless the athletes, God bless the athletes, but a lot of the athletes who pl- play in these larger schools, if they couldn't play, and if they were admitted based on academics alone, they would not be at the school. But Brother Gary, I guarantee you they're not going to touch them because that's the school's cash cow. And you're going to protect your cow, even if you got the, your sacred cow, your cash cow, even if you got to find a way to bend the rules. I, I heard someone say one time about Ma- March Madness, said the greatest madness of March Madness is the fact that the overwhelming majority of those athletes you sat there on the court will never graduate. And that's madness. But for for that that time period, those guys are balling and they're having a ball and they live the rest of their lives in the shadow of March Madness. Many of them can't afford to buy the tickets to go to see the game live and in person once the madness is over. I believe as never before that uh, we have to look at things. We need to discuss things. Uh, what the Supreme Court did, uh, they did. Uh, I, my, my mind may change on it, uh, I, I, uh, on, uh, on, on, on their ruling. I'm not sure uh, and whether I agree with it or not. I do believe that at some time point, 
that uh, it was going to it was going to uh, come to a close because it wasn't put there to stay forever. But I want to mention this in my closing. Then I want to invite you to service in the book of Ruth. You will see where a Moabite woman, Ruth, she was not a Jew. She married one of the daughters, uh, one of the sons of Naomi. And you know what happened. The sons died, the daddy died, and and uh, Naomi ended up going back home bitter. And Ruth went with her, said, your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. Where you go, I will go. All of that. And so uh, 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 Ruth, uh, by pledge, basically became a Hebrew, but she was actually a daughter of Moab. And yet when that beautiful woman went out to glean, they gave her a job. But the reapers who were reaping, they left something for Ruth. And that's that's the way I see affirmative action. I don't believe that, uh, and we'll unpack this more, I don't believe that it's the will of God for anybody to do anybody's work for them. I actually believe the scripture that says if a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. But I also believe that there is a way to treat the disadvantaged. I believe that there are disadvantaged people. I believe that there is a way to treat this stranger. The Bible speaks of how we're to speak uh, treat the strangers. And and that way is not to give a freeloader a meal uh, forever. It's not to uh, help somebody who is unwilling to help themselves, but it is to grant them an opportunity to do the work. And that's what the gleaners did for Ruth. They left something for her to glean and she worked and she ended up being the wife of Boaz and she ended up in the family line of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, my time is up. I'm excited. I'm excited. Listen, affirmative action is not dead. You're not going to die. Black folk aren't going to, going to all of a sudden uh, lose their right to go to colleges. You're not going to lose your right to go to Harvard. You're not going to lose your right to go to UNC. And uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about the 99 HBCUs in this country, which, by the way, only 10% of African Americans attend. And uh, we'll talk to you about that. Also, but uh, hey, work, study, go to school. The ruling just says your complexion can't be considered as a part of admissions. And I know that that's a that's a problem for many. But and for those who have that problem, and I'm not saying that I don't, but for those who do. Don't make it broader than what it is. Don't scare people. Oh, God. Oh, they're getting ready to send us back to Africa in chains. You can't send me back. I've never been there. I'm an American. This is my home. People ask me, where, where's your home? Rockingham, North Carolina. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's where I was born. I'm a native. I'm an American. I spoke to a bunch of lawyers one time and they, they introduced me as an African-American preacher. And I told them if I'm if I'm a hyphenated American, the rest of you are also. There's people in here with Irish descent, Asian descent, uh, Indian descent, all these descents. And uh, I mean, all you guys are calling yourselves Americans. And uh, but you're going to hyphenate me. So, yes, I am an American of, of, uh, of African descent. I'm proud to be a black man. But at the same time, my brothers, I'm a full-blooded American just like you. And I thank God for my African roots. I thank God for my American roots. I thank God for being born in Rockingham, North Carolina, Richmond County, and living here in the beautiful city of Raleigh that I call God's country. Now join me here tonight at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ for Bible study. Yes, we're going to study the word of the Lord together. God bless you. Make it a great day.